Tonight's case involves a handsome young man who enjoys torturing and killing young women. Liked it so much. As a matter of fact, he tortured and killed many of them before being stabbed. Besides the boy next door killer, he has also been called the Hollywood Ripper, just like the old Lucifer. You know that having someone's throat cut is one of the most painful methods of death. In addition to being horrific beyond description, the pain may have also caused the victims to vomit. They would drown and suffocate on the vomit and blood of their own. Due to shock and extreme terror, the victims likely defecated themselves as well. It's even worse than modern killers. Take the victim's place after they've been killed, which is even more painful. As the steel cut into their flesh, they would have been acutely aware of their surroundings, yet not awakened by the adrenaline. As a matter of fact, the Hollywood Ripper's victims suffered before they died. He tortured them and not only took their lives. Ashley Ellery, like many beautiful young women in Hollywood, was attractively vibrant and fun-loving. She was a party girl with plenty of friends. Ashley lived in an enclave frequented by actors, directors, producers, and others seeking a foothold in the spotlight. It is unknown why the 22-year-old left her upper-middle-class family in Northern California and arrived in Hollywood in 1999. The striking blonde soon gained attention and began modeling. Additionally, she enrolled in the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising, as she was creative and thought she could become a designer. However, there is no such thing as a free lunch in life. Ashley's friend said, she used cocaine and crystal meth, as part of her Hollywood lifestyle. At parties, she would use drugs, she also enjoyed taking trips to Las Vegas, where she worked as a stripper and pole dancer. Ashley's roommate, Jennifer DeSisto, said Ashley hung out with many Hollywood celebrities. She was friendly and free-spirited. Ashley's biggest coup was getting Ashton Kutcher as a boyfriend. After seeing each other out and in Hollywood, he invited her to a post-Grammy Awards party on 21st of February 2001. Kutcher planned to watch the ceremony at a friend's house, and meet Ashley afterward around 10.30 p.m. At 7.30 p.m., they talked on the phone, and again at 8.24 p.m. But Ashley. Never showed up. So, when Kutcher couldn't reach her cell phone, he drove to her home, thinking that she might be waiting for him to pick her up. After knocking on the door at 10.45 p.m., he still did not get any response. Despite his best efforts, the doorknob was locked. Through a window, Kutcher couldn't see any apparent problems. The only thing that caught his eye was a dark red spill on a landing leading to her bedroom that resembled a glass of red wine. He assumed she was upset and brushed him off. Assuming she was out with someone else. Kutcher left. Ashley's roommates didn't sleep at home that night, because she had left her keys at her friend's house. She had knocked on the door half an hour before Kutcher arrived, hoping to get in. The following day, when Jennifer could not find an answer, she left and returned at 8 p.m., after retrieving her keys. At first, the girl didn't notice anything unusual when she entered the house. Then she saw Ashley on the carpeted landing. According to Jennifer, her friend was blue in the face, and had some blood around her mouth, at first glance. She then approached the woman. Her heart was broken, as she witnessed the horror of what had occurred. Ashley lay face up on the landing, dressed in a turquoise terry cloth robe, in a large pool of blood. She had apparently been attacked by someone who tried to sever her head. She had created a wound so deep that it could only be stopped by her spinal cord. Having gouged a V. Shaped wound across her back, he tried finishing the job from behind. A stream of blood spattered the walls, ceiling, and even on the bathroom floor from the murder weapon. Jennifer immediately called 911, and the authorities arrived soon after. Upon closer inspection, it turned out that the model was stabbed 47 times, despite her valiant attempts to fend off the attacker's hands and arms, at one point even grabbing the blade of the knife. The wounds in her chest, abdomen, and back, were so deep that they passed through her lung. According to the medical examiner, 12 of the wounds were 15 centimeters deep, and would have been fatal on their own. She was also stabbed in the back of the head. 
it appears one of the stabbings penetrated the skull, removing a chunk of the skull in the shape of a puzzle piece. Ashley's legs were slightly apart, and one of them was benched, and this was an unusual way to lie down, leading the police officers to speculate that her body had been moved after the murder. The bloody Adidas tennis shoe print on the hardwood living room floor led away from the horrific scene. The officer who reported to the crime scene as the lead detective was Detective Thomas Small. Small stated, This was extreme violence. The killer was a modern-day Jack the Ripper, brutal and very personal. Inflicting as many wounds as possible was the intention. In this case, the serial killer was someone who had done the same thing before and got away with it. Small determined that the crime was neither a sexual assault nor robbery. Ashley was wearing jewelry, and $300 in cash was found in her home. She wore a bra, boxer-style underwear, and sleeveless undergarments under her robe. The windows were barred with security bars, and the front door was behind a metal screen door. There were no signs of prying. Ashley had neither given the killer a key nor invited him inside the home. Small inquired about Ashley's acquaintances immediately after finding the body. There are plenty of people to interview. Small's partner, Detective Thomas, spoke to Kutcher, who had not called 911. Despite the lack of window coverings, Kutcher said that he could clearly see into the residence, but her response was like that the place was a bit disorganized since she was painting her walls so that didn't raise any alarms for him. Kutcher told the detective that he saw red wine on the carpet area leading to her bedroom, which he believed to be red wine. Ashley's father was visiting and helping with the renovation of her home. The last time she saw him was at the airport at 5.30 p.m., on the day of her death. On that same evening, Mark Durbin, the house manager of Ashley's rental house, had come to fix a light fixture which led to Ashley and Durbin having sex, as he testified later. About 8.15 p.m., Durbin was getting ready to leave when Ashley asked him not to go. She didn't want to attend the Grammy party. In addition to Durbin's involvement with another woman, she was to visit his house. As he was leaving, he shut the front door, looked back through the window, and kissed Ashley goodbye. The front of Ashley's home could be seen from Durbin's apartment when he lived there. An hour later, he noticed a motion sensor lighting up the walkway outside his window. In the light, Durbin saw a man about six feet tall walking back and forth. Detective Small interviewed dozens of people, but one constant kept popping up, the heater guy. Ashley's friends seemed to have a lot to say about a mysterious heater repairman who kept popping up in her life. Her life had been disturbed ever since he appeared. In front of her house, she and friends of Christopher Durant were fixing a flat tire on his car. According to Durant's later testimony, the man walked up to assist. He was a heating and air conditioning technician. The stranger began showing up at Ashley's house for unannounced visits. Across the street from her home, he walked his dog at the park where he lived. He told a story about one particular incident. The heater guy, had shown up at Duran's door sweating out of breath, telling Ashley and Duran that the cops were at his house. Trying to find out about his ex-girlfriend in Chicago. She was killed, and he avoided the police. Justin Peterson, who had briefly lived with Ashley, later testified that the man had grabbed his arm and squeezed it very hard, while in the car after attending an art gallery opening. Around 10 p.m., he dropped the stranger off at a green Ford pickup. When he returned home, he shared with Ashley what happened, and that was around 3 a.m., so the truck parked in front, the motor running and lights off. A person sitting inside. The next day, a man arrived to fix Ashley's heater, and Peterson was asked what the man was doing outside. Upon being confronted. After stuttering, the stranger told Peterson he couldn't go home because of the FBI. That was waiting to collect DNA samples from him. Peterson was then informed that his best friend's girlfriend had been martyred. A month before Ashley died, she had thrown a party, and the mysterious stranger was invited. Throughout the evening, he sat on the couch, did not interact with anyone, and only stared at Ashley. Peterson told the police that Ashley did not fear him because she thought he was a nice person. In the line of work of Detective Smalls, 
Too many coincidences usually raise suspicion. This strange heater guy, who had no name, had never been Ashley's friend or lover. Even so, he was always in her company. Ashley has always been friendly. In numerous interviews, Small learned that the heater man once boasted about suing the truck owner who had struck him while crossing a street near his home. The vehicle belonged to a contractor who was constructing the Kodak Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. The company was contacted to inquire about lawsuits with pedestrians, and Small did a record check on older reported accidents in that area around the time of construction, and came up with a hit. Apparently, someone had struck a dog whose owner had been, Michael Gargiulo. So, now he had a name. A picture of the driver's license followed. In light of the new information, Small presented his witnesses with a set of six photos, including Gargiulo's, and asked them to identify Gargiulo if possible, and they did. As Small continued to work on the case, things took an unexpected turn in the fall of 2002. A few detectives from the Cook County Sheriff's Office visited Small one day at work. The detectives had a picture, and the name of Gargiulo. Police from Cook County sought a DNA sample from Gargiulo for an investigation involving a murder in 1993. Having been unable to locate it, Small arranged a search warrant for a new Los Angeles address, where Gargiulo had last lived. There was also a DNA sample taken from the van he drove. Detectives located the van and found three knives, a box cutter, binoculars, and the vehicle's license plates inside. Gargiulo's apartment was sparsely furnished, with only a kitchen table, a chair, and men's clothing hanging in the closet. Besides the Halloween mask, a handgun was also found in a backpack. In the aftermath of Gargiulo's return to his home, blood, hair, and urine samples were taken for a DNA test that would be sent to Cook County. While Gargiulo was driving to the hospital, he muttered, What if my DNA was on the keychain? They can't find my DNA at the crime scene from 10 years ago, can they? How did it take them so long to find the DNA? Michael Palatier, the detective who took Gargiulo to the hospital, later testified that he asked what Gargiulo was talking about. He simply replied, Never mind. A beautiful studio famous 18-year-old girl, Trisha Pakaxio, once lived in the Midwest, getting ready to move to Purdue University to major in genetic engineering, grew up in Glenview, a prestigious Chicago suburb. Trisha lived a storybook life full of cheerleading friends, music, and the debate team. Not interested in drinking or partying, Trisha prefers to read or study at home. She also lived one block from Gargiulo. Her boyfriend was taking Trisha to a doctor's appointment, and she was walking down the street to meet him. Gargiulo 17 stopped in his father's van with another friend to offer Trisha a ride. She accepted it and was dropped off at the designated meeting place. Following her normal routine, Trisha went to work as usual at a cosmetics counter in a department store. Then, she came home and took a shower, before going to a road rally with two friends. The girls had dinner at a TGI Friday's restaurant, and Trisha went home at 12.25 a.m. that night. On the front porch with a key in hand, Trisha never stepped inside. It was someone who came up behind Trisha, twisting her left arm behind her back to the point where it fractured, causing her immediate and intense pain. She was then stabbed 12 times, and three of her fatal wounds were to the heart, left lung, and abdomen. In addition to her arm, she was also stabbed in the collarbone and the back. Trisha had no opportunity to fight back as the attack happened so quickly. The young woman dropped her door key as she fell to the ground. But she could do one thing that would help detectives 17 years in the future. Her nails contained someone's DNA. Her body was not discovered until her father opened the front door the following day. Unable to bear the tragedy, Trisha's family moved out of the home. The DNA of other tissues' fingernails was then recovered by medical examiners. In spite of this, they could not make much progress until Gargiulo blood samples arrived in 2003 from Los Angeles. Maria Bruno, a working-class woman in El Monte, California, 
could easily blend into the landscape at home while going about the daily grind. 24 kilometers west of here and a lower income area, live the residents of that wealthy Los Angeles neighborhood. Over the past few decades, it has seen an influx of prostitution, drugs, and gang crime. There are pockets, however, where people like Maria, 32 and single, live in relative safety and comfort. However, that was about to change on 1st of December 2015. A Jack the Ripper killer struck inside Maria's apartments that night. His frenzied attack left the beautiful and well-liked model looking drained in her own blood. The killer had the benefit of a non-closed area where he could spend time systematically mutilating her body. As Maria was going to sleep, the killer entered her apartment through the kitchen window. A butcher knife from the kitchen, he took to slash her throat to the spine and stabbed the petite woman 17 times in her chest, arm, and abdomen. As part of her murder, she had both breasts cut off, one of them being placed in her gaping mouth. A few days before Maria's death, she had mentioned to friends that there was a strange guy in the building watching her, he had followed her from the parking lot into her apartment and suddenly left within 10 seconds. Her ex-husband Urban Bruno discovered her body, who came to her house to take her to work. Due to their amicable divorce and friendship, he was not considered a suspect. Maria's stalker knew her routine, and that she lived alone. The killer's modus operandi suggested a person who planned it, was methodical, systematic, organized, and knew what they were doing. He may have spent several hours at the crime scene. Upon arriving at Maria's apartment, the detective discovered a blue hospital-style paper booty. There were still blood and skin cells around the plastic that was not large enough to match DNA. The city of Santa Monica is a wealthy playground with sun, fun, and beautiful people. It was home to Michelle Murphy in 2008. 28-year-old blonde lived a dozen blocks from the beach in an apartment upstairs in the movie post-production industry. Jogging or exercising in her apartment's carport is one of her favorite pastimes. Occasionally, Michelle would see a van parked in the alley with the name Gus, the plumber, on the side. Every now and then, she would see a tall, dark-haired man near the van and say hello in passing. In the early hours of 28th of April 2008, Michelle went to sleep as usual, but I suddenly awoke to the searing pain of someone stabbing her in the chest. He straddled her and continued stabbing her in the shoulder and right arm as she wriggled sideways to escape. A blade slashes Michelle's fingers to the bone at one point. Michelle was nude and slippery due to blood, so the assailant struggled to control her. The attacker slashed his own wrist at one point. The pause that he made enabled Michelle to push him off the bed and onto the wall, he hit the door. The attacker mumbled sorry, before running out the front door. The attacker had entered through the window but exited through the front door after the attack. Michelle's quick thinking and agility had saved her life. Detective Lewis responded to the scene and found blood trails leading down the stairs running toward Michelle's apartment. The blood-soaked bedding was tested for DNA as well as the outside droplets. Lewis discovered a match a month later, thanks to the DNA blood sample, that Chicago investigators had entered into a national database. It was Michael Gargiulo. In 2007, Gargiulo had started working for Gus, the plumber. By this time, he was legally married and had moved in with Ana Luis Gonzalez, his wife. Michelle Murphy lived across the alley from them in a Santa Monica apartment. Gargiulo's new home gave him an unobstructed view of Murphy's kitchen and dining room. At the time of Murphy's attack, Anna Luis was asleep at home. After receiving the DNA match, Detective Lewis remembered the visit he had received a few months earlier from Detective Lillenfeld. Lillenfeld inquired about the murder of Juliana Reading in Santa Monica to see if it was similar to Maria Bruno's. Reading's case turned out to be unrelated, but Luis now wondered if Murphy's attack might be linked. After speaking with Chicago detectives about Gargiulo, Luis also discovered another lead. He was told that LAPD had a similar stabbing. The three detectives decided to meet with a deputy district attorney. Murphy's case was pretty simple, so less than two months after the attack, the district attorney filed a charge of attempted murder against him. 
Based on Gargiulo's address, Lillenfeld discovered that Mario Bruno lived in the same apartment complex as Gargiulo. Even though Gargiulo had long gone, Lillenfeld searched the apartment and found nothing in the central areas, but noticed an attic and crawled into it. The blue medical booty he found up there was similar to the one he found two years earlier in front of Maria Bruno's apartments, this time, they had enough skin cells on the booty to do a DNA test, and it came back to Gargiulo. With DNA evidence linking Gargiulo to two murders and one attempted murder, Detective Small had enough circumstantial evidence and the similarities of the four cases to file his own cases with the district attorney's office. Gargiulo was charged on October 20, 2008 with both Bruno and Ellen's murders. On the 7th of July 2011, the Cook County State's attorney charged Gargiulo with the first-degree murder of Trisha Pacaxio as well. It took a very long time for the Hollywood Ripper to be brought to court. Since there were too many loose ends to tie up, Gargiulo spent the interim in the L.A. County Jail. According to Lillenfeld, a Los Angeles County Sheriff's homicide detective, Gargiulo gave law enforcement authorities a cryptic statement after he was jailed in California in 2008. According to Lillenfeld, Gargiulo said he was an air conditioner repairman and was in thousands of homes over the years. Gargiulo allegedly first told authorities that, just because 10 women in those homes were killed and my DNA was present does not mean I murdered anyone. According to the police, no more murders have been officially linked to him as of 2021. Los Angeles Superior Court held a pretrial hearing on June 9, 2017. The trials for his capital crimes were scheduled for October 2017. After delays, his trial began on the 2nd of May 20th, 19th. Star actor Ashton Kutcher testified about the crimes in court on that day. Gargiulo was convicted on all counts on the 15th of August, 2019. The 16th of July of the current year, 2021, was so. Gargiulo was given the death penalty. It is unlikely he will be executed any time soon. As long as Governor Gavin Newsom is in office, California will not execute anyone. I guess that was since 2006. But the courts have been proceeding on the assumption that executions may take one day to rescue. And with that, we come to the end of the saga of Michael Gargiulo. The Hollywood Ripper. Thank you. Good night. Good luck.